Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. It is such a pleasure to welcome you to the launch of our paper, Navigating Cryptocurrency Regulation, an industry perspective on the insights and tools needed to shape balanced crypto regulation. This is a paper being put forth, promulgated by the World Economic Forum's first ever Global Future Council on Cryptocurrencies. I'm extremely proud of this particular council, which is the first of its kind here at the forum and really reflects a multitude of stakeholder perspectives, both from a global perspective, from different countries, uh, but also from different protocols. And that's pretty unusual in this space, which tends to be quite opinionated and factionalized. But what we noticed in the course of conversation among council members was that there was a strong sense that there was a need to provide a more balanced perspective from across the industry of what would actually help in the regulatory environment, what would actually help both spur innovation and adoption in positive ways, but also help mitigate risk. So the fundamental premise of the paper is that regulation is not only inevitable, it's actually beneficial if it's done in a balanced and nuanced way. To kick off the conversation, it's my great pleasure to introduce Danelle Dixon. She is the CEO of Stellar Development Foundation and one of the core authors of this paper. Stellar, for those who may not be familiar, is a foundation that works to focus on unlocking the world's economic potential. Before joining Stellar, Danelle was the CEO of Mozilla, and she is a lawyer just like me and close to my heart. Danelle, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Sheila. That's great. I'm so happy to be here. It's an honor to be moderating this discussion today. So we have a deep interest in driving financial inclusion through blockchain innovation. So I was really excited to be involved in drafting the regulatory framework that will help support informed policymaking, consumer protection, and open innovation in our sector. The World Economic Forum's Global Financial Council on Cryptocurrencies brought together great minds from a, from a variety of geographies and disciplines from business and technology to legal and regulatory, we all contributed our views on how regulators might foster innovation of blockchain and cryptocurrencies that can improve the lives of citizens all around the world. We paid special attention to the complex needs of regulators with these new kinds of cross-jurisdictional assets and called out examples of best practices. So after many thoughtful discussions, late night writing sessions and video conferences, we're all very excited to be introducing our collective work to policymakers and innovators. Today, we are releasing the GFCC's regulatory framework, a document that reflects our diverse group's recommendations and aspirations for a well-regulated and more inclusive financial system enabled by blockchain and cryptocurrency. So now I'm delighted to introduce our panelists for today's discussion. First, I have Caroline Malcolm. She's the senior advisor at the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. Caroline brings her expertise in tax treatment and reporting to the OECD to inform, inform on taxation, best practices for digital assets and uses of blockchain for administration. Caroline has led and convened groups at the Global Blockchain Policy Center and Financial Stability Board and was recognized as a young global leader by the World Economic Forum. Welcome, Caroline. Next, we have Wailam Kwok, a senior executive director at Abu Dhabi Global Market. Wailam leads the capital markets division responsible for authorization and supervision of financial market infrastructures and capital markets intermediaries. He also spearheads SF FSRA's strategy and efforts in the supervision of financial technology, innovation and development of the FinTech ecosystem in ADGM. Welcome, Wailam. And here today with us from FINRA is Haimera Worki, who leads the Office of Financial Innovation. The department is focused on fintech innovation and analyzing emerging risks and trends related to the securities market. Previously, Jaime was the director in the Division of Trading and Markets at the SEC and earned degrees at MIT, as well as his JD from the Harvard Law School. So here we have another lawyer. Welcome, Jaime. And also, I'll introduce Dr. Elfin Chess, senior technologist at Mercy Corps, who co-founded FinX VC and Mercy Corps Ventures to expand financial inclusion through crypto investments, pilots, and capacity building in Sub-Saharan Africa, the Middle East, Latin America, and the Caribbean. Alpin obtained his PhD at MIT in International Development and Technology Policy and has previously worked at the World Bank Group, Harvard School of Public Health, Risk Management Solutions. Welcome, Alpin. And we also have Ambassador Gabriel Abed of Barbados, who's serving in the United Arab Emirates. Gabe is chairman of Abed Group and co-founder of BIT. He is internationally recognized as a leading authority on central bank digital currencies, math-based protocols, and blockchain technology globally. 
having conceptualized and initiated the first global movement to encourage the use of central bank digital currencies. Welcome, Gabe. And last, but certainly not least, we have Paul Maley, who comes to us from Deutsche Bank in London, working as the global head of security services and head of the corporate bank in the UK and Ireland. He has worked in capital markets for more than two decades. An early proponent of the technology, Paul has been involved in the blockchain and distributed ledger, ledger industry since 2013. Since then, he's helped to establish and advise a number of startups, open source projects, and fintech consortiums. Welcome, Paul. To anchor the discussion today, we will highlight the role of blockchain digital assets and cryptocurrencies in solving real world problems. Some of the most pressing issues affect the world's unbanked and underbanked population. Many of these questions were taken into consideration during our collaboration on the regulatory framework. But let me start off with the first question directed at Caroline. So Caroline, how can regulators and policymakers design regulatory and policy frameworks to balance innovation that brings affordability and financial inclusion while maintaining oversight and consumer protection? Thanks a lot, Danelle. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, look, the challenge you speak about is really something which I think is, is not specific to, to, to this particular technology. It's something we see as we see advances um, really across the policy spectrum. So I think, I think we should keep that in mind. Often we think we have a very unique case and yes, blockchain is very unique in, in many, many ways, but there are there is this, this common challenge that regulators face as, as industry continues to innovate, how to keep keep up with that, sure that it uh, develops in a way which protects the interests of consumers and society as a whole in line with the values that, that we've expressed that, that, that we, we believe should underpin our society, but also letting that, that innovation take place. And I think it's absolutely right to say that this is sort of a, a very difficult line to walk and, and there's not necessarily one right way, but something I I think which is really being able to find kind of that 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 middle road which balances out those those interests which are not necessarily contradiction can sort of come into to tension at times um, is to have that dialogue with with industry and to try and do it very very early and often um, and that's sort of a, a motto that we've always tried to bring to to the work that we've done uh, relating to blockchain and, and more broadly with technology at, at the OECD is to have that engagement whether it be sort of through industry groups also with academia civil society to really have that diversity of perspectives coming out so that we can put those guardrails in place which is really the expectation that societies have that, that innovation does take place but it does take place in a way which is, is pursuant and I think also really in the long-term interest of, of industry as well this is not something which is anti-industry or anti-innovation but making sure that innovation can take place in a way which is going to be sustainable over over the long term not not just in an environmental sense but in, in terms of kind of not going to be subject later on to, to regulation which really means that the kind of technology or the industry has to has to pivot in a, in a really significant way so i think there's really sort of no golden key to, to and then this, this question of sort of early and often dialogue no i think that's great public to private partnership is always one of those things that's really important so next, I want to jump to Wailam and Alpen. First, Wailam, what are some of the challenges in bridging that the different financial systems and making them interoperable between countries and sometimes radically different regulation? Wailam? I would say that when this industry took off some four years ago, the crypto regulatory landscape was nascent with no regulation and regulatory framework in most jurisdictions. Uh, but this has shifted in the last year and a half, and a number of jurisdictions are starting to regulate the industry. Uh, even then, unlike regulations pertaining to the traditional financial service, uh, where there's a high level of uh, harmonization across jurisdictions, um, standards applicable to crypto um, varies widely across jurisdictions, with most regulators not up to speed on industry development. Um, for, for us at ADGM, um, we have decided that we want to set a high bar from the outset and then to address the risk uh, to the financial sector and concerns of different types of investors. The decision to regulate this space very early on and given the rapidly evolving nature of technology uh, innovation uh, means that we need to be agile and continually keep ourselves updated of developments through deep engagements with uh, fellow regulatory and industry stakeholders. Uh, so we have act been actively participating at the global regulatory and uh, industry forums to have the conversation such as the IOSCO and digital, uh, the global digital finance, uh, 
to share and discuss our regulatory approach and experiences. Uh, and being um, the first, in a way, the first mover uh, presents a lot of challenges because uh, we really don't know how the industry will evolve. Uh, but indeed, for us, we have taken, uh, as I mean, Caroline has mentioned, that it's very difficult to find a balance between uh, regulations and innovation. And typically, um, innovation should not, uh, regulations should not front run innovation. But for this crypto asset space, we've taken the approach that right at the outset, we want to adopt a very high bar. And over time, as we engage the industry to understand the innovation, uh, we want to then be able to fine tune it. So at the end of it, agility is key. That's one. Um, Caroline mentioned about collaboration. I think that's very important. Uh, we have to collaborate with the regulatory stakeholders as well as the industry stakeholders. Uh, one key example is with the um, travel rule requirement. We are now collaborating with technology providers and other regulators to work on a proof of concept system to navigate how mutual authentication can be facilitated with minimum impact on performance and workflows by maintaining privacy so as to facilitate uh, the VSPs compliance uh, with the principles of the travel rule. And the system will then allow the VSPs to securely exchange information on originators and beneficiaries when transferring assets. So those are some of the real uh, on the ground uh, stuff we are doing in order to um, expedite uh, knowledge exchange as well as hopefully harmonize the regulatory requirements. Thank you. Alpen, how about you? Any thoughts on the interoperability piece? Yeah, thanks, Danelle. Um, <clears throat> I'll just add a few points um, and, and agree with what was just said before. Essentially that, I mean, we, we have a system that has um, a lot of fragmentation right now. And I think that people are looking to leverage a lot of what's possible with these cross-border technologies um, to improve uh, certain types of patchwork um, or uh, fragmented systems in, in our current um, model. And I think that uh, there's there's another balance that's also trying to be played out essentially that has to do with um, the, the the operational uh, priorities around financial inclusion versus financial integrity um, and I think that what we're seeing right now is that um, there's there's things that need to be taken into account to make sure that we find that balance um, and I think um, essentially there's um, there's there's also a, another question around, um, the fact that in some of these uh, standard setting bodies like uh, FATF, BIS, and others, um, what we're seeing is that uh, certain types of standards that are developed have an unequal kind of effect um, in terms of enforcement in different jurisdictions. And what we're seeing in the data is that it's playing out in terms of the usage of cryptocurrencies or the adoption of these, of these types of technologies. Um, and I think that um, taking that into account is actually going to have a, a major effect um, going forward as more and more jurisdictions are able to actually uh, comply with and, and uh, moderate some of these financial integrity related regulations on the ground. Yeah, thanks. I think the financial integrity point isn't one that I had actually really focused so much on until actually we got together and did this paper because you raised a lot of it during that discussion. So that was really helpful. Um, Gabe. On all of these issues about usage of uh, blockchain and cryptocurrency, recognizing that cross-jurisdictional and the digital nature of these assets is a challenge for regulators, what are some of the important considerations that you've actually thought through in working with central banks um, in either creating or supporting their use? Because this is a, the topic today, CBDCs. Yeah, um, so I think what's important to understand, and really it's, it's paramount, is education. Um, education really does come at the forefront of this space, especially for that of the financial regulators and monetary authorities such as central banks. And it's from that place of education that it then births a, a much greater understanding of what these technologies really represent. Um, it allows for much more enhanced monitoring and visibility over a financial system. Um, it, 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 can, it can bode for a much more efficient uh, economy and, and marketplace. It creates a, a much superior uh, payment uh, ecosystem. And I think those are some of the key areas that, that central banks are really starting to drive home right now. But then more specifically, the understanding that these types of technologies are actually bringing prosperity and economic growth to the citizenry and to the corporations. And while it's a central bank's job to ensure the stability and trust of, of the dollar and the economy is there, 
it, it's, it's part of the mandate as well to ensure economic stimulation occurs. And, and one of the key things that we're seeing is that central banks are beginning to realize that it's actually in their best interest to begin supporting these types of technologies. Um, the other side of it is central banks are, and, and monetary authorities and regulators in general are realizing that within their own domestic markets, they do have subject matter experts that they can lean on and, and bring into the fold to actually help with that educational process, um, help create a watchdog type of environment, which in essence uh, helps bolster a much better ecosystem for supporting uh, what's right and what's wrong, rather than central banks themselves having to feel like they need to take on uh, these activities on their own. They're, they're, they're realizing that their domestic market in, in many cases do have the best interests at heart of their local economies. Um, but there's also an understanding that every single, and I think Wailam touched on this earlier, is that understanding that every single market is different. Um, so when, when speaking about what can be done on a cross-border basis, you know, the, the standards, the laws, and the appetites, they change from country to country. And it's, it's all about um, continuous education and, and con continuously to evolve the, the type of engagement that occurs, because that is, that is really paramount. It's not just a learn once and that's it. It's a constant learning curve. What was... What was new and innovative last year is now outdated today. I mean, we've seen in 2017 ICOs, uh, in, in, in 2020 or 2021, we're seeing NFTs, and these types of subjects are going to continuously come because this field is only now getting started. We're, we're, we're what, 11 years into the blockchain evolution, and, and if we were to judge the internet based on its 11-year cycle, well, we'd be, we'd be making some serious mistakes. And I think central bankers are waking up to realize that's the reality that they're living in, that these tools actually are in fact their best friends. It's no longer a system of, uh, that these systems are used for drug users or hackers. It's now realizing that this is enhancing their capability of doing their job uh, with, with a higher level of accuracy. And, and we're starting to see that, which is, which is, the, which is I, I think, um, one of the greater blessings in, in the last few years that we're noticing. Um, but it's also an understanding that uh, there's major risk. It's not all, all flowers and perfume. There's, there's some major risks that are faced to central banks that they need to uh, gather their thoughts around, such as capital flight risk and, and hacking and, and these various other cybersecurity um, uh, flaws that may come about. And it all, once again, boils back to my very first statement. It's a continuous uh, process of education, education, education. You're muted, Danelle. I just wanted to keep you guys on your toes. Um, I love the idea of thinking about and comparing uh, what we're doing now in this space to what happened in the internet, because it is such an important thing to think through how young this technology is and how much growth we actually get, are gonna see here in this space. Jaime, many households depend on remittances and businesses rely on cross-border payments. So how do cryptocurrencies help decrease friction when value travels between countries and in different systems? Yeah, um, so, I mean, there's a number of ways they do that. I mean, one is, is really by the peer-to-peer -peer relationship. Um, kind of from our vantage point at FINRA, our, our focus is really um, on kind of what are the potential benefits that exist as a result of blockchain technology, looking at from primarily from a securities lens as opposed to a payment lens, but then also thinking about it from the context of what are the potential benefits uh, and, and risk that those benefits that potentially uh, bring on. If you allow me to digress a little bit, um, about a year back, a friend of mine um, got me a present uh, where we went to the, uh, where we got a, like an adventure package in West Virginia. Um, and we were going to go zip lining with me and my wife for anniversary, uh, as well as by water rafting. And I was really excited. You know, my, my first thought about this was like, oh my God, this is going to be so much fun. Um, and, you know, my wife's reaction was, well, are we going to need helmets when we go whitewater water rafting? Are there going to be a lot of rocks there? Uh, you know, how high are we going to be going zip lining? Uh, 
Um, and, you know, the idea around crypto really kind of brings these two issues into forefront, right? You know, you need to think, you need to have a sense of an adventurous spirit to be able to explore what's possible out there. You need to realize what's potentially beneficial for the industry, both from an investor standpoint, both from a firm standpoint. But then you also need to step back a little bit and realize what types of new risks are potentially being introduced to the system. And what type of mitigation factors do you have in order to be able to address those risks? It's really both from a regulatory standpoint and an industry standpoint, when you can mar uh, marry those two ideas that you're able to really take the full advantage of, of what blockchain can offer. Yeah, I think that's really true. In the chat box, or someone noted that, that from their standpoint, that from a consumer side and an enterprise side, the changes and the education needs to happen so much so often, like every four to six months, because everything changes so quickly. You just look at where the industry was in January and look at where it is today. It's in a completely different space. So uh, I love the work that everyone here is doing to really focus on the remittance use case and to really make that come to fruition and to decrease that friction. But I wanna turn our attention to the opportunities being presented by the DeFi application to businesses and consumers, because cryptocurrency and blockchains make new kinds of financial products and services possible in the form of decentralized finance. Uh, Paul, what are some of the needs being addressed by DeFi applications using digital assets? No, thanks, Danelle. I, uh, I, I thought you might give that question to me, so I, I was pondering it before the, the meeting. Um, uh, the, I, in answering that, I don't want to almost mention like an individual use case, right? Because we could talk about decentralized exchanges, right? We could talk about like smart contracts. Um, what I almost wanted to talk about was like the foundational advantages that the technology brings, which everything else kind of like builds on top. So, you know, when I first got involved in this, uh, in this arena about eight years ago, um, there was two kind of like immediate case studies that I thought had the most uh, had the most gravity for what the industry was going to do next. The first one was the idea of federated trust. The fact that you would be able to trust something or trust somebody, right, without necessarily needing to have to go through the due diligence and or the trusting of a third party to represent that somebody else was trustworthy. The second element was the idea of trying to eliminate non-repudiation from like inside the financial industry, right? So that you could know that if something happened, whether or not it was uh, something related to a contract or right, some other kind of events, like you know, we might consider akin to a corporate action, that what would follow next would then happen kind of automatically, right? Without somebody else needing to do something. I think if we think about the, the potential for distributed finance, we should keep reminding ourselves of those two advantages. And then, the other thing that I would say it generates on top, particularly is I think one of the most difficult things we'll need to um, address. I mean, Danelle, you mentioned earlier the challenges around uh, you know the cross jurisdictional nature around the way you know financial markets already oper operate. The next one that comes along, of course, is interoperability between the old ecosystem and and then let's call it the new one, right? I don't think any of us would believe ever for a moment that we simply just go home on a Friday and then come back on a Monday and let the actual infrastructure has changed. It's going to be a very, very gradual progression. And I'm sure it would take, you know, more than a decade, right? But what we need to be able to start to do now is create like the, the toll gates, right? The ways in which those kind of like two parts of the financial markets like intersect, right? And then eventually they will become like more and more seamless. I think there might be a point in time where you eventually start to decommission Right, the way those services operated before, like obviously we all familiar with using like relational databases, and then we move on to like like the new world infrastructure that you know that blockchains and systems built via distributed finance uh, would enable. Um, so I think there's a, a the, the number of possibilities are completely endless. Right, right now we are we are just scratching the surface of what's going to happen next. I do think that this is an area that's particularly interesting and I think challenging for regulators. Does anybody want to speak to the challenges that regulator, regulators face with respect to DeFi and specifically? I think that, uh, first of all, I think some people don't, it was a great explanation of essentially the, the, the value that DeFi brings and the different um, opportunities and, and products they bring. Because I think a lot of people use the term and don't know what it means, but what are the challenges regulators face with respect to not only understanding this, but figuring out how they're going to get their arms around it. I think one of the challenges, if I could jump in, is what does it mean to be decentralized, right? 
Um, you frequently have these DeFi systems that are set up uh, where you'll have one or a group of operators that, that's actually setting up the process. Um, then we'll hand it over to another group that's typically run off base of governance tokens. So they'll have no, people who stake a certain value into it and receive a certain amount of governance tokens. And based off those governance tokens, set up rules for things like interest rates that need to be charged on a DeFi lending system or rules for other types of services that may be provided. Um, and you get to, and you ask yourself, you know, kind of what does that mean? You know, in some ways, uh, it, it, it almost looks like a shareholder that's holding holding shares in a company where you have voting rights that 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 allow you to be able to control interest in, in what's going on in the company. In other ways, it's very different, right? Because you have these autonomous systems that's software enabled that basically run off what's going on, and you have potentially less uh, specific controls. Um, but getting around what it means to be decentralized um, and what that means for the underlying risks that exist within the system, I think is important. A good example of that is these governance tokens are frequently um, available for sale in the secondary markets, right? Um, and uh, if those governance tokens are owned by different people than the stakeholders that exist on the marketplace, what does that mean for the governance of how things are run? Um, and then kind of moving on from, from the governance side, another thing to think about are, are the products that are offered on these networks, right? So um, are things like you know, Zcash or other types of products that potentially raise issues from regulatory perspectives running on those networks? Is thought given to the status of those products, whether they be derivative products, securities products, um, commodities, at least in the, in the US lingo? Um, and what does that mean for the rules of the road for how they're actually interacted? Um, uh, when you're dealing with different participants or shedding, uh, setting up trading venues where you can actually engage in transactions. Um, so, uh, you know, it's one thing that always I like to think about when you see new technologies are the technologies are very, um, and frequently be very innovative and interesting and set up ways to do for different business models. But from a regulatory perspective, that overlay of things that you want to be concerned about from consumer or investor standpoints are still there and they can't be ignored. Um, so again, like going back to the theme, while you want to kind of promote innovation and you want to have different ways of being able to do things in a way that's more efficient, in a way that potentially provides services to people that you couldn't before, you also have to be aware um, that reason for a regulatory framework that existed in kind of the old world, if you will, um, was for specific purposes. And what are the ways in which those purposes are being satisfied in this new framework? I, I, then if I could I'll, jump in there. Uh, sorry, Willem, you go ahead. No, go on. Go on, please, Gabriel. You go on first. I'll make mine quick. I, I honestly, and, and this is probably, Willem, you could confirm this, but it's probably the most challenging time that it's ever been in history for regulators. You know, they're waking up every single morning with a new subject that they need to become educated on. And these new subjects can quickly balloon to billions of dollars in value, um, touching many of their citizens overnight. And the balancing act of having to educate and then decide what what is the best protocol or action to take because the reality is to do nothing you potentially provide systemic risk to your economy um, and to do something you're potentially thwarting opportunities for your citizens uh, so it's it's that very difficult place right now and the the, the what makes it even more complex is that it's consistently changing and that the, the learning curve is, is extremely steep. You know, we thought we got our heads around ICOs, but then all of a sudden there's this new thing called non-fungible tokens or, or governance tokens and all these various other aspects of, of the technologies that are coming, coming to life. And it seems like they come about, you know, Paul, as you said, you go, you go home on a Friday you come, you come back to work on a Monday and it's like, hey, there's this new technology and an image of a rock just sold for a million dollars. And, and what's going on there? Uh, so it's, it's that new challenge is, is, I think, providing a whole new way for regulators to have to really reinvent themselves and understand that this isn't the old way of doing things. And the conservative approach of, of sitting back, doing the research, analyzing, considering, and then taking action may not necessarily work in today's markets. So if I could just jump in there, um, 
Paul mentioned very um, a few use cases and opportunities that DeFi presents. And from a regulatory perspective, we recognize that the benefits that DeFi can bring to the industry. I would say as a regulator, I identify a few risks that uh, it can be posed to the users. Uh, one of them would be, it is unclear who is accountable for DeFi services. Uh, it is not clear users of DeFi should be considered as self-dealing because their transactions are directly with other users' wallets. Uh, administrators of a DeFi service may deny liability if the service were to malfunction. The second risk I would see is that uh, DeFi is actually less understandable than the traditional finance. Uh, although the behavior of the smart contract may be published, it is not clear whether users of DeFi services can understand what that means. Um, furthermore, uh, users may have incorrect uh, expectations of DeFi services given the widespread use of uh, traditional financial terms. Uh, the last piece that I see is, has to do with uh, uh, money laundering and terrorist financing activities. Uh, it's possible to create multiple transactions from one service, uh, potentially, uh, potentially making tracing of uh, such activities harder to track. So as a regulator, I always ask this question, um, um, uh, should DeFi be regulated? Who should be regulated? And what should be regulated about DeFi? So it is a regulatory nightmare and the challenges are uh, clear and present. Well, what I love about this is it sort of brings us full circle to the one of the first things I think Gabe said, which is education, education, education. And what I also loved is that, Jaime, you started off by using that shareholder word, which we're all really afraid of. Um, but then you tried to get to the place of understanding that that is maybe one component that it looks like, but there are other things in there that are different. And I think that that's part of education. It's pulling it apart and figuring out, like Wylam said, about the different components of it and what that means. So. It's not easy, but I think together in that public to private partnership, we can really, really make this happen. Um, Alpin, I have a question for you around stable coins. How do stable coins fit into um, the DeFi model or also just like in terms of the being offered for uh, remittances? Thanks, Danielle. Um, yeah, happy to answer that. Also just wanted to chime in on the, on the previous point in that um, one of the things that we're seeing with uh, innovations like DeFi is that they are efforts at disintermediation um, and sometimes they create new kinds of intermediaries and that I think is the challenge for regulators to understand what, you know, what, what does that actually look like and how to, how to regulate that. But in some cases um, they create entities like for instance, these uh, DAOs, decentralized autonomous organizations which also create um, questions, definitional questions. Um, again, for regulators, this is a challenge in that um, regulations generally are, and regulators are pre-assigned to specific bodies and areas of, of monitoring supervision. And when you have these types of innovations, it's hard to see ex exactly where this would fit. Um, I think stable coins uh, coming to that point um, are obviously a very important topic. Um, uh, just to highlight one, one thing in particular about stable coins that is of importance from a financial inclusion perspective, which is primarily um, what, um, what some of the folks that we're working with um, on the international development and humanitarian side is around the ways in which stable coins um, mitigate some of the volatility risk um, for, for conducting cross-border payments in a real-time fashion, um, in a low cost, in a, in a low cost or, or, and low friction modality. Um, and what we're, we're trying to understand, essentially, um, and, and I, to be quite honest, I think we're, we're just beginning to see uh, new use cases for it um, beyond the um, internal crypto economic uses. So you have a lot of uh, transactions being taken, kind of taking place with stable coins within crypto to crypto or between cryptocurrencies. Um, and now you're seeing uh, the uses of stable coins in large part now in, in, in all types of different um, sectors, uh, including what Gabe mentioned in terms of non-fungible tokens. Um, you also see people holding their, their balances, to corporate treasuries in, in stable coin or interest uh, earning stable coin um, accounts. Um, from a in financial inclusion perspective, you know, remittances still account for a majority of how people support their, uh, you know, get support when they, when they need um, additional money for large expense, uh, expenditures, for, for living expenditures. People support their families and friends abroad uh, using remittances. And this, uh, this tool of a stable coin um, actually provides uh, 
uh, significant advantages around, again, real-time um, um, transfer um, and understanding that the value that you're transferring from you know, one country is gonna stay consistent on the other side. Uh, we're actually testing, just as a couple of examples, um, how this can be used for vulnerable populations. Um, we, we're often asked by regulators, like what is the actual evidence of financial inclusion from some of these technologies? And so we've been testing a few. One of them is around um, uh, under and unemployed youth that are trying to get access to job opportunities on the internet. Yet, you know, even if they're able to um, complete tasks or um, uh, have, the, have the skills to, to engage in the digital economy, they, they hit up against walls when it comes to receiving payments. And because we work in a lot of countries that are considered quote unquote high risk in the current financial system, um, you can see that the costs and the delays and uh, the frictions for receiving payments on the digital economy for some of these people are quite high. By using stable coins, they're able to essentially be paid um, in a much more reliable way and a low cost way. Um, we're also seeing use cases related to refugee populations, for instance, that are moving between one country to another, and they're not necessarily uh, have they don't necessarily have the easiest uh, pathway to opening up uh, bank accounts um, in in their, their in the new country. So that could be because they're uh, you know an official refugee, and the country may not have a pathway for them to open up uh, a, um, a bank account. Um, but it may also be that there are um, other roadblocks. Uh, they may be, be an informal refugee um, and will never necessarily have the, the required paperwork to, to open up a bank account. And so private World Economic Forum. Oh wow. Oh, I think I was hearing something else. Um, and so what we're, what we're really excited about, um, and obviously I think that there's risks on all sides that need to be taken into account, is how can these technologies be used for especially vulnerable populations that we, we can agree on, either we define them as unbanked or as ex excluded from the current financial system, and um, how we can address those needs using these technologies while keeping in mind that we have a lot of other risks related to um, illicit finance and others that we need to, to monitor. Um, of course, what we're trying to also balance that with is the fact that blockchain enabled uh, transactions allow us to monitor and, and audit transactions in ways that you couldn't otherwise do from the cash side. Um, and that's primarily the, the, the default that we see in almost all the markets we work in is that people are operating on cash and this provides an alternative that's actually auditable um, in, a, in a way that wasn't possible before. Thank you, Alpha, and that's awesome. I think that this is one of the use cases that I think folks talk about a lot and having, being able to describe like how this actually benefit, benefits the end user, I think is a really important part of um, really teaching people about blockchain and the value of it. So let's discuss ways that the industry might communicate with regulators to address the needs of all stakeholders. And that includes technology companies, entrepreneurs, and consumers. And, and Caroline, I wanted to ask you, um, we've observed that when regulators only approach cryptocurrency as a tax raising opportunity, as we saw here in the US, it can hamper development of new technology, or it can also really light a fire under um, the, the community to respond to it. How can regulators harness the revenue opportunity while still creating and enabling an environment for the industry to grow across multiple use cases? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question to know. And I think obviously, look, the discussion around the infrastructure bill and the crypto tax reporting provisions, you know, did, did cause a lot of, of, of attention. And uh, I think, I mean, Yes, obviously, there's a there's a revenue raising element to it. I think no, no doubt about that. And, and the sort of numbers that were thrown around were sort of very interesting from a headline perspective. But I think the reality is, and I think this is also where the sort of flip side for industry is, is that in wanting to have the, you know, the ear of, of, of regulators and wanting regulators to adapt to, you know, this new technology is that we also need to see this recognition from, from industry as well that, in a lot of these cases, um, you know, the, the it's coming back to sort of your first question around, you know, how to approach regulation in a fast moving space is often you will take a sort of a principle based approach and look at what's happening. So I think 
I think for anyone who's been watching this space and has seen the kind of evolution over the last four or five years of kind of introduction and, and, and now kind of revision or update to, to, to the AML rules, we'll probably not be surprised to have seen, you know, crypto tax reporting provisions come into, into this space. Um, and in the same way we saw before that sort of, you know, beginning to have some guidance around how these, this new asset class fitted into tax treatment rules. And I think what's so interesting about that is in, a, in, in many cases, when we look at inserting legal framework into the crypto space in, in the case of tax, is that there are analogies, there are ways to make those systems fit together. In, in most cases, not in all, but in most cases, you don't necessarily need an evolution of, of the system. It's about thinking through, okay, how, uh, you know, how, uh, you know, hard forks similar to other things we've seen either in traditional finance or in other parts of the economy are similar and therefore should be treated similarly in, in, a, in, a, in a tax sense. And so I think that kind of flip side to wanting, you know, regulatory clarity we also have to recognize that there is often rules that already exist and complying with those laws is really a first step. So what we're seeing is in terms of crypto tax reporting, I think, um, and look, I, I don't want to get too much into the specifics there because I think what we ultimately saw, you know, we saw the, the first draft come out, we saw lots and lots of discussion, different proposals put out there and ultimately we ended up back at the first draft. Um, but I think really what was going on there is, and is kind of, also seeing that this was a case of making sure that, you know, Treasury had the powers to then work on something that was more detailed, work on something which was appropriate, that didn't capture people that didn't need to be captured, you know, miners and, and, and so, you know, particular nodes in the system and so forth. So I think, you know, that's why I don't want to kind of get too much into the, the, the detail of what was in the infrastructure bill, because I think, you know, it's interesting because I think a lot of the discussion was premised on perhaps, um, some ill will which exists perhaps between the industry and, and, and sort of regulators sort of say, well, you know, you need to act, you need to provide clarity in this space. But in a lot of cases, you do have existing rules. And I think that's really got to be the first step. The law as it stands today does apply. And I think it's interesting for this space because you start, if we go back to the origins, you start from a very um, anti the system movement and as we've passed through time we've seen that you know wanting to be part of that system wanting to have the growth that being part of that system allows but part of that is is recognizing that there are these rules which already exist which which need to be be complied with so i think that's sort of a, a first point so i think that's kind of the flip side to the point i was making originally that regulators need to listen they need to engage early and often with with what's happening in terms of tech developments but equally you know there are these rules which have been developed over time, often starting with this principle-based approach, which can then delve into specific details as, as needed. Um, but I think there, there, there needs to be that kind of recognition on, on, on both sides. Um, and maybe I might just take the opportunity of, 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 of having my friend for just a moment to come back to, to something you were talking about in terms of, you know, how do you make regulation at a very high level in the kind of we, when you're dealing with decentralized systems, and I think something that we and, and, and you know, some of the other um, uh, people that, that we talk to are really thinking about is thinking about, you know, working with decentralized systems, not just from a kind of a top down, well, these are the laws and that's how they apply, because as we've talked about, you know, a lot of the things that we've taken for granted in legal systems, like there's somebody on who you can place liability, for example, is not the case when, when or it's not as clear as it might be when it comes to um, decentralized systems. But I think looking at kind of these different sort of mechanisms around kind of like this, you know, back to the early 2000s around sort of code is law and thinking about, well, you have law, but you also have different mechanisms to keep the whole system in check. And that can be, um, you know, social social norms, that can be market demands, that can be sort of the code, the architecture, which can all fit together with the laws. And then you have user behavior, of course, to, to sort of, to, to, to kind of create a, an ecosystem, which is not just reliant on, on laws and kind of in terms of achieving different policy objectives, but looking at the ecosystem as a whole. And I think that kind of more holistic approach may be one that, that we continue to explore as, as kind of DeFi and, and these decentralized systems uh, develop. I may um, also expand on that uh, based on your question of where can regulators also see new areas of revenue and it's 
it's not just from the taxation side of things, it's actually applying said technology to the existing systems that they use today. Um, if I could just touch on, on one example with central banks, the, the cost to print fiat currency, it's, it's relatively expensive. And, and there is a, a benefit to central banks known as synergy, which is the money that they, they make after uh, against the, the cost of printing. And, and when you look at using something like blockchain technology, when applied to that process, you're talking about 99.9% .9 efficiency uh, against that, that, that's, that, that level of synergy. And then if you, you can really extrapolate this to any area of, of the, the regulation cycle, um, even all the way down to how they collect taxes, uh, you, can, you can begin using things like smart contracts directly at the point of sale where two outputs are created, uh, one that goes to the merchant and where the regulator, uh, the tax authority is being paid real time. Uh, so it's, it's really just not just looking at trying to, to tax, uh, to tax the, 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 the revenue potentials, but looking at how the same technology that the entrepreneurs or the corporations are using, how the regulators and the tax agencies themselves can apply that and get a greater level of efficiency and a much uh, greater service for themselves. So I love that, Gabe. And this sort of leans into a question that I was going to ask Paul, which is taking it on the flip side from the builder standpoint, and this is one that was put in, in the chat, how do builders, how should they approach this? Because I think it's the, it's the same idea. When you think about central banks and them looking at their technology and seeing where they can leverage blockchain to help them and to generate more revenue for themselves, like Paul, what can builders do to help create that conversation or to think about it or get regulators to think about it from that standpoint? Um, it's a, uh, the, I mean, I do, I can't help thinking um, that maybe we're missing an industry body, right? And uh, I, I'm not, I'm only mentioning this as an example because I know it has some wrinkles that as an industry we would need to talk about, right? But I, I kind of help thinking like something akin to for DeFi uh, that might be similar to what people would recognize uh, the role that is the performs might actually um, uh, provide like some utility, right? Like there, there's a, uh, a you know a way that you can create almost a a clearinghouse for requirements, so that if you are a builder and you almost say, look, I can't go to one place because right now I have a really fragmented uh, environment, and if I solve for just one jurisdiction. I don't know if I can actually then port it to any other jurisdictions. Um, that's obviously a really difficult place to weigh. And I think that's obviously also something that stifles innovation, right? Because you can't build efficiently um, in the same way that you could say in the current you know, securities markets, right? Where there's a, a much higher level of kind of, shall we say, standardization, even though the regulation in say Europe or inside the European Union is actually fundamentally very different to obviously what we would recognize in the United States with like, you know, the act of 33 and the act of 34. So it's not necessarily that countries need to be the same, but like people need to know that those things sort of have um, technological and product outcomes that they would uh, recognize and that they could build towards. Um, it was already mentioned uh, earlier by some of the uh, some of the other speakers. Like, is is around like who sets the standards? I think it was uh, I think it was Alpen that was referenced. Like, we have these these um, you know uh, you know uh, 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 multinational authorities, but how they're actually implemented in individual jurisdictions, right, becomes uh, becomes more difficult. Um, I think if there was a way of being able to represent um, you know either new use cases, right, or new uh, product ideas. Um, in a way that you could get some kind of like consensus feedback, uh, I think that would be a really useful, um, a really useful outcome. Maybe today is the day we uh, we we start that uh, <laughs> we start that idea. <laughs> That's great. Let's do it. All right. So what I want to do now is I want to open it up for all of the audience to ask questions or to offer some ideas. Here we have about ten minutes left, so let's open that up. And anyone can jump in. I have questions if no one else is going to. Okay, well, we did have one question that was in the box that talked about, um, Caroline, do you have an example where current regulation applies to digital assets with little or no change? <laughs> 
That's a tough yeah, one. Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe not as tough as people think, and I think that's where the, you know the, some of the issue lies is that when you get into the detail. And I'll take taxes as as you know, kind of the area of, of focus, because that's you know the OECD's done some some work in this area recently, looking at tax treatment uh, of of crypto across. Um, about 50 jurisdictions, so predominantly OECD members, but also some, some non-OECD economies as, as well. And if we look there, for example, we can see that in the mo for, for the most part, countries classify crypto as intangible property and the tax treatment then flows from there. Or And that's in the case of income taxes, or if we think in the virtual tax space, they're treated as similar to fiat currency and, and, and the tax treatment flows from there. So I think there's, there is, a, there is cases where we can see that there are analogies to be made. You don't, it, you know, a revolution is not necessarily quite, I mean, I don't want to say that there's not, there's certainly areas where we need to either see clarity or, you know, further law development to, to, to reflect the changing circumstances or the changing features. And I'd certainly, certainly be the first to, to say that because I think in some ways um, the underlying technology really challenges what we've thought of as, of as tech neutrality in, in our laws. And I think because I think a lot of the assumptions that we have in many of our laws, um, particularly around this idea that there'll be one person responsible or there's some entity that you can put your hands on. And we see that in the draft law for, for MICA, for the markets in crypto asset law in, in, in Europe, for example, where, you know, in the absence of having that person, a person will be designated or that you need to create an entity in order for them to then apply the rules in a very similar way historically. So I certainly recognize that, but I think in some cases, and I, you know, there are, and, and taxes is just one example where we can draw analogies which are relevant, which, you know, do hold um, and, and where we can therefore apply um, existing frameworks onto, onto these new forms of assets. Okay, anyone from the audience? Um, I, I have a question. Uh... So uh, we mentioned uh, in, in the report that uh, digital identity will play a huge uh, part in de-risking uh, some of the cryptocurrency risks, uh, especially when, when we're sending or receiving transactions of, of large uh, sums of money. Uh, where do you see this uh, mechanism residing? Is it within the blockchain ecosystem or as an artificial or external layer, I would say, uh, at the government side, or do you see big tech playing this role of providing digital identity? If I could just take a quick stab at that, Dr. Marwan, I actually think it would be all three. Um, and it really does have to be a combination of all three. Uh, uh, what I mean by that is identity is really uh, something that needs to come down from the, the top down approach, as in the government or the authorities themselves are the ones that usually do clarify a state-based identity level, um, we would see the advantages of using blockchain for such a circumstance from the efficiencies that it brings to uh, the clarity, uh, the provability, the tracking, um, and the other aspects. And then we'll see big tech enabling uh, the intersection between the government and the utility of blockchain-based identity. Uh, this would enable a much cleaner, uh, more recognizable um, much more transparent marketplace, because at the end of the day, one of the biggest costs that corporations face, and you often hear this fiasco around banking called de-risking, um, anti-money laundering, counter-terrorism financing, and all these other uh, three-letter words or, or acronyms, it usually boils down to the, the failure to adequately identify a transaction or a person behind such a transaction. And being able to uh, create a much more efficient marketplace that allows a lower cost to the corporation to have their users become identified, allow a much more provable environment around that identification, it ultimately will um, ease the mechanisms of transactional activity. It would create a much more accurate environment for the regulators. And then it does leave that level of a perfect paper trail in the form of an immutable ledger system. Yeah, I, I let me let me just uh, append to what uh, what Gabe was saying there, and, and thank you, Dr. Marwan, for that question. Um, if you actually look at some uh, um, uh, there's some very interesting consortium work in Europe that's already started. ID Union uh, is worth taking uh, a look at. That's an, uh, an open source project. 
Um, but that's exactly what I meant earlier when I started to, when I was referring to like federated trust, right? I think the, the manifestation of that as a product is like a digital identity. Um, and uh, uh, yes, of course, that does need to rely on some kind of like, you know, government sponsored authentication for how that, um, how that, you know, identity would manifest itself. But there's many other ways, right, um, that a private individual can create a self-sovereign identity. And there's no reason why, obviously, a corporate entity or a legal entity of some other flavor can't do that using uh, many of the, of the same techniques. So um, I think that's actually one of the biggest enablers um, uh, of the whole DeFi space, right, is that we actually solve that problem. Um, so let me just do a follow-up question to this. What about the reputation system? So do you think like having multiple identities with, uh, with uh, corroborated kind of sources of providers, uh, as uh, Gabriel mentioned, uh, with a mix up of systems, do you think that has a place also? Uh, and should it also be based on, on, on uh, blockchain technology? If I could quickly shoot off the gun here again, uh, I don't think identity is just one thing. It's not just a national identity or passport, driver's license, your social identity. It's a combination of many, many different things. And ultimately, whether it's your reputation, your credit, your, your, your university degree, your diploma, all of these things are eventually going to meet an intersection. And that's why blockchain is, is so cool for this type of application, because it allows these different types of asset classes, if you will, to interface and interoperate in a way that makes them useful to whoever is looking to validate against that position. And I don't think, again, identity is just one thing. It's made up of many things. Many of you in this room know me as Gabriel, and you might be my social identification mechanism. But beyond that, the government may know me as a Gabriel from a different type of identification perspective. And ultimately, it depends on uh, the application that we're aiming to, to uh, authenticate towards, and that will define the type of identification uh, asset it's going to draw from. So the short answer to your question, Dr. Marwan, is yes, it's going to be a mix-up of, and this is my opinion, I, I think it's going to be a mix-up of, of several different types of sources of truth of who you as a person uh, are. And, and I love this because we're already seeing industry, private industry work with governments in different parts of the world to start to do some of this. And so I think it's a really interesting space that we're gonna see grow some more. There's obviously privacy considerations that individuals wanna think through about this. And uh, so there's a lot there to unpack, but I do think it's a really cool area for blockchain and to see how the future holds in it. Thank you. Any other comments or thoughts from the audience? Okay, I'm gonna jump in and I have a question for Jaime and Alpin. There's a recognition that industry is primarily responsible for communicating the value of blockchain. This is different. Um, when we, in the early days of the web, we sort of uh, didn't believe that we needed to, to do that, that we needed to work with government and to communicate what the value of uh, the technology was that we were building. And I think that there's a really nice shift here. Uh, on this side, but how can industry better communicate with regulators and improve their understanding? Is it a use case focus? Is it a technology focus? How can we do this? Jaime, why don't we start with you first? Yeah, you know, I, I think it's important for us as regulators to be mindful of the benefits. Um, and, and I think it's, it's, it's also helpful for the industry to communicate kind of how this technology can maybe add efficiencies to the marketplace. Um, how it can potentially uh, offer the types of services to investors they potentially couldn't have before. All that being said, I, I think the role of regulators is not to put the scales on one type of technology or another type of technology. It's really to allow an environment in which various types of technologies can compete on an equal footing. Um, and as such, I think, you know, what's important is when industry comes and talks, at least, you know, with respect to uh, our organization, it's important that they've thought out kind of, you know, what are the benefits are and how they, they may change things, but also what are the potential kind of new risks that are being introduced to the system? Um, not to say that and there may be some old risks that are getting taken away, but they've thought that out and they thought about what are the mitigants around that? What is the way to the extent they think the current laws don't apply in a way that is appropriate? 
what are the principles those laws are trying to serve that's, that's being served in the new dynamic? How are they meeting those objectives? Um, and, and I think that will help having the discussion with the regulators um, because I think that's primarily what we are thinking about or kind of what are the potential new risks are being introduced to the system? What are the ways in which things may differ that we may have to think about? We may be able to achieve the same thing, but maybe doing them in a way that's a little bit different. Um, I think all that is, is having the context of the benefits. It's important to have all that as, as kind of background information. But I think those are primarily the areas that I think most regulators focus in on. Sure. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just add a little bit. I think, um, and I think the main point is that it's, it's interesting in the world of cryptocurrencies and, and, and blockchain and that a lot of the activity taking place is done quite transparently, at least in the op from an operational standpoint, and that like a lot of the code is open source. Um, a lot of the conversations and discussions taking place happen in these like Discord chat rooms and whatnot. And so there's a lot of there's a lot of activity taking place like out in the open, quote unquote, like even um, yet, um, you know, clearly there's there's an asymmetry of information in terms of, you know, what exactly is taking place, uh, what kinds of innovations are being developed. Um, and one of the things that um, crypto brings up is that it's, it's, it's essentially introducing financial primitives to the internet that obviously are going to create a whole new set of, of, of risks and issues that um, need to be dealt with. And I think that, as Jaime mentioned, um, there's a lot that uh, innovators that, that are now operating at scale can do to uh, be a little bit more proactive about understanding like what are mechanisms that uh, can be uh, integrated to mitigate risk, um, how to communicate risks that are actually emanating from their, from their platforms or from the, from the system at large. I'm, I'm starting to see more academic articles, um, including you know, authors from, from the sector itself, talking about the risks that, that DeFi, for instance, actually uh, generate that need to be dealt with. Um, and then I think that um, as Gabe mentioned, there's an education component that's going to be ever present. Just one, this is definitely an iterative technology. Um, at the same time, I think one of the things that doesn't get communicated uh, enough is that crypto is more than um, you know, financial assets or financial transactions or uh, doesn't necessarily get um, encapsulated in the financial um, um, uh, framework or paradigm because blockchains, as Paul mentioned, are, um, you know, paradigmatically different in terms of how we communicate trust between parties. And that has implications across the board for how we store data, how we access data, how we transfer it. Um, the tokens that are generated with uh, crypto applications embed rights in very new um, and, and in some ways unprecedented ways as we're seeing with NFTs, et cetera, that um, need to be taken into account. I think that there's education on all sides I think at, at this point that need to be dealt with. Uh, and I think more of it is actually just gonna help. Um, um, and, and, and I agree that it's, it's a little bit different than what we saw in the previous era with, with internet um, and, and uh, communications technology. Again, this is you know, front and center, like the financial applications are front and center right now. And so I think that uh, there needs to be more of that uh, two-way communication. Thank you, Alpin. I think, Brad, I, I was going to jump to you and I was going to say, I know we're a few minutes over, but we're, we're, we started a few late. So Brad, I know that you feel very passionately about education and I thought maybe you could have the floor on that. Yeah. Well, obviously, I mean, I think you introduced this at the beginning that, you know, education globally is critical. I think, uh, you know, Jaime's comments he just made resonate with me in that in, in, it's frankly interesting that uh, the US in many ways, I think is behind the education scale. And I think one of the things that we can all do, I think is highlight what leadership we're seeing from other countries that are acting very responsibly and you know, having thoughtful regulation where there is appropriate oversight. It's not you know, uh, unregulated by any stretch. And I think here in the US, the more we can do to highlight that leadership in other countries, uh, I think the more useful it is for companies trying to operate in the US. And obviously, as the largest economy in the world, I think no matter where you're based, you should care uh, about what's happening here in the US. And so 
part of that is not picking favorites. Part of that is uh, having clear rules of the road. And, uh, you know, so I think the more we can do to educate, as you introduced at the beginning, Danelle, I think the better. Yeah, thanks, Brad. I mean, that's part of the, it's the blessing and the curse of this when there's new technology. But I do think if there's openness on the regulatory side to hear, I think that there's a lot of people on the other side that really want to talk. Um, so I think it's really honing in and, and leveraging some of the, the ways that Jaime thought about, about articulating that to regulators that we need to um, really think through as we present these things uh, out in the world. This was an awesome panel. Thank you guys. Thanks to the audience for joining us. It was the, a really nice way to spend an hour in the morning. Um, please do take a look at the Global Financial Council on Cryptocurrencies paper on navigating the cryptocurrency regulation. The link is gonna be put in the chat box. I'm grateful that you all came uh, and thank you to our panelists and to Wes for, um, for putting this together for us.